Did you know that Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine, was actually a latecomer to the medical field? Hello and welcome to World History Encyclopedia. My name is Kelly and today's video is all about physicians, health and medicine in the ancient world. Don't forget, the easiest way to support us is by giving this video a thumbs up, subscribing to our channel and hitting that bell icon for notifications so you don't miss out on any new uploads. World History Encyclopedia is a non-profit organisation and we are on Patreon. Patreon is a brilliant site that offers exclusive benefits to those who subscribe. Your support helps us create videos twice a week for you. So make sure to check it out via the pop-up in the top corner of the screen or via the Patreon link down below. In Mesopotamia, the goddess Gula, who is also known as Ninkarak and Nini Sinna, presided over health and healing with her consort, Pavilsag, her sons, Damu and Ninazu, and her daughter, Gunura. She was known as the Great Physician of the Black-Headed Ones, with the Black-Headed Ones being the Sumerians. The rod with the serpent intertwined, which is still a symbol used to this day, originated not with the Greek god Asclepius, but with Gula's son, Ninazu, who was associated with serpents, healing, and the underworld. The serpent symbolized regeneration and transformation, since it would shed its skin. Doctors were agents through which the deities worked to maintain the health of their people. As it is now, their main job was to cure people's illnesses, and their first step was to identify the cause of it. Illness in Mesopotamia was often referred to as the hand of. For example, the patient has been touched by the hand of the god Shamash, or the demon Lamashtu. And then, to be cured of their suffering, the patient had to confess the sin which caused the illness and submit to the proper treatment. The sin may have been knowingly or unknowingly committed. To put it simply, illness was caused by sin and the cure required some form of confession and acknowledgement of wrongdoing. Even if one god wanted you healthy, another god may have been offended. The illness may not even be caused by a god, but by a ghost that was allowed to cause the trouble. The library of Ashurbanipal housed medical books, which shows the Mesopotamians had extensive medical knowledge. This is in direct contrast to what Herodotus in his histories wrote about them, which was that they didn't have any regular doctors and they would just bring their sick out onto the street and get advice from people who walked past. We know that there were two types of doctors in Mesopotamia. The Asu, who was a medical doctor who treated illness and injury, and the Asipu, who was a healer who practiced what we would consider as magic, and were also the ones to deal with testing for pregnancies and fertility. There were also surgeons, dentists, veterinarians, and midwives known as Sabsutu who delivered babies. The dentist pulled teeth or relieved toothaches, and surgeons performed surgery with clean hands and knew to wash wounds with clean water. While the Asipu relied explicitly on the supernatural, the Asu dealt with physical symptoms, and they were both considered with equal respect. Both Asu and Asipu treated patients in temples and on house calls. The cult centre for the goddess Gula is in Isin, and it might have served as a training centre for physicians who would then be sent to other temples to work as needed. Both men and women could be doctors, but female physicians were most common in Sumer. Texts from Mesopotamia tell us that doctors shaved their heads to be easily identified, and the Gula hymn from around 1400 BCE tells of doctors moving around the city with herbs, texts and tools to heal people. The fees for services were more expensive for the higher classes than for the lower. The same prescription made of the same ingredients may have cost a prince some gold, but a poor person a bowl of soup. The medicine of Mesopotamia had a huge influence on the Egyptians, so that's where we're looking at next. Medicine in ancient Egypt was quite advanced, and the mortality rate after Egyptian medical procedures was probably less than that of European hospitals until the mid 20th century due to the Egyptian value of cleanliness. As with Mesopotamia, illness was usually understood as a consequence of sin, or they were plagued by an angry ghost or god that thought they had a lesson to learn. Therefore, the earliest form of a doctor in Egypt was a magician, 
who would treat disease with medical spells. They also used incantations, amulets, aromas, offerings and tattoos. These were to placate the god who caused the illness, drive away the demon or ghost, or invoke a higher power to prevent illness and protect. Medical texts were spells and incantations written on papyrus scrolls, and only a few have survived. The surviving papyri deal with things like contraception, fertility, heart disease, diabetes, depression and pregnancy. One papyrus, which dates between 1782 and 1570 BCE, offers prescriptions to skin and eye issues and burns. Another from the New Kingdom treats UTIs and digestive problems. One papyrus from the 3rd century CE is all about magical spells and divination, and another from circa 1200 BCE prescribes cannabis to cancer patients. This predates Herodotus's mention of the drug, which was thought to be the earliest mention of cannabis. Egyptian doctors made house calls, and they were considered priests of the Per Ankh, or the House of Life. The House of Life was a type of school slash library attached to a temple. Doctors could be male or female, and the first known physician from Egypt is Imhotep, the architect of the Steppe Pyramid of Djosa at Saqqara, who was later deified as a god of healing and medicine. The first female doctor known by name is Merit Ptah from the early dynastic period, circa 2700 BCE, although there is evidence for a woman who ran a medical school at the Temple of Neith at Sais in circa 3000 BCE, but her name is unknown. The female physician Peseshet, who lived around 2500 BCE, was the lady overseer of female physicians, and was possibly associated with the Sais school at the Temple of Neith. Doctors had specialities, but there was also the Sunu, or general practitioner, the Sa'u, whose specialty was using magic, then there were the nurses, midwives, masseurs, attendants, and seers. Only midwives and women of the house would be present at births, not doctors. There were dentists as far back as the early dynastic period, although they didn't develop as widely, and Queen Hatshepsut, among others, died of an abscessed tooth. The use of herbs, spices and incantations was common by both dentists and doctors. This combined use of magic and physical medicine was personified by Heka, the god of magic and medicine, who carried a staff with serpents coiled around it. Other healing deities include Sekhmet, Serket, Sobek and Nefertum, and all priests of Serket were doctors, although not all doctors were priests of Serket. Many of the instruments used in Egyptian surgeries are still used today, like the scalpel, dental pliers, the catheter, forceps, and scissors, among others. Prosthetic limbs made of wood have been found, and human remains show people who survived after amputations and brain surgeries. You'd think, with their practice of mummification and embalming, that the Egyptian doctors would have had a good idea of how the internal organs work together, but the professions of medicine and embalming moved in different spheres and didn't seem to see a reason to share information with each other. The medicine of ancient Egypt was greatly admired by the Greeks, so let's have a look at what they got up to in the world of medicine. In ancient Greece, illness was considered a divine punishment, and healing was a gift from the gods. However, by the 5th century BCE, there is evidence of attempts to identify physical causes for illness. They began to move away from the spiritual, but they never fully separated from it. The god Asclepius was both the god of healing and medicine, and also a doctor, whose main sanctuary was at Epidaurus. Asclepius was called upon by patients in the hope that he would send them advice in their dreams that the doctors could then act upon. We see evidence of practical medicine in Homer's Iliad set during the Trojan War, such as when Patroclus cleans a wound of a comrade with warm water. Probably the best known name from ancient Greek medicine is Hippocrates, who was born in the 5th century BCE on the island of Kos, where he eventually established a medical school. He wrote 60 treatises on medicine known as the Hippocratic Corpus, and is known today as the father of modern medicine, because the earlier Mesopotamian and Egyptian texts were unknown to the Europeans who gave him that honorific. He remains the best known ancient healer in the West, and modern versions of the Hippocratic Oath, which is named after him, is still sworn by medical students to this day, with the same underlying vow to do no harm. 
Anyone in ancient Greece could just set out as a doctor and practice the techne or skill of medicine without any official training. Treatments used were natural plants like herbs and roots, as well as amulets and charms. They carried out minor operations, but usually, as with most of the ancient world, surgery was avoided because of the risks involved. Even without any training, Greek doctors still knew it was important to clean wounds and that stopping excessive blood loss was important. Although there were many errors during this period, like Aristotle believing that the heart controlled the body, not the brain, they were definitely heading in the right direction. Rome followed in the footsteps of the Greeks with no official training or qualifications for doctors. The first known Greek doctor to give his healing skills a go in Rome was Archagathus of Sparta, who arrived in Rome in 219 BCE and is credited as the one who brought Greek medical practices to Rome. There was a lot of literature in ancient Rome dedicated to medicine, and although much of it has been lost, some of the medical texts written by successful physicians in Rome have survived. Roman tombs and sites like Pompeii have been valuable sources of information on Roman medical practices. Artwork has survived showing special chairs to give birth on and medical instruments like scalpels and probes. Even more helpful is the hundreds of tweezers, forceps, needles and other instruments that have survived. Pills were made from herbs and plants and some sort of metallic ingredient. Pills often incorporated exotic ingredients as well as a lot of faith in everyday goods, such as cabbage, which was considered to be helpful with digestion, and the fumes of boiled cabbage directed into the womb could help with fertility. Surgery was used as a last resort only, and was usually limited to issues on the body's surface. The most well-known physician from Rome was the Greek physician, author and philosopher Galen of Pergamon, who lived between 129 and circa 216 CE. He was a favourite in the imperial household from Marcus Aurelius to Septimius Severus. He wrote extensive commentaries on the Hippocratic Corpus, which is what all the treatises written by Hippocrates are known as, and worked tirelessly using dissection of animals, since the use of human cadavers was strictly forbidden, to extend his medical knowledge. Galen supported the concept in the Hippocratic Corpus known as the Four Humours. The Four Humours were blood, phlegm, yellow bile and black bile. They controlled the human condition and were related to the four elements, air, water, fire and earth. If there was an imbalance of these humours, it would cause illness. These four humours were also paired with the four qualities of heat, cold, wet and dry, and this concept would continue to be in use for over 1500 years. What aspect of ancient medicine was most surprising to you, if any? Let us know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on our new videos every Tuesday and Friday. This video was brought to you by World History Encyclopedia. For more great articles and interactive content, head to our website via the link below. If you like my sweater, you can find this design and a bunch more in our shop at worldhistory.store or you can find the link under our merch tab. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you soon with another video.